one. Common sense. Thank you. Um, good evening. Welcome to Progressive Soup. My name is David Stevenson, and uh, with me I have uh, now good friend Dave Strait on, on one major issue, and we're going to discuss that today. Now, how in the world does a guy that's as far left of center as I am, and a guy that's as far right of center as Dave Strait, how in the world can we talk about anything? Well, you know from watching Progressive Soup that we've reached out to a lot of folks, uh, libertarians, um, good friend Billy Michael, shout out to you Billy Michael, um, Kyle Scheich, good uh, shout out to you Kyle Scheich, and many, many other people that have some serious disagreements with myself and other liberals and progressives. And yet we find something to talk about, we sit down, we discuss it, and we, we find we have some, some good common ground. Now the reason why Dave's here is because I found a card of his, and I'll let him explain about the card, I'll let him explain about deer management, and uh, we'll have a conversation. Dave, go right ahead. Well, thanks for having me on the show, it's a real honor. And you know, if you go far enough left, you end up where? <laughs> the right? Right, there you go. <laughs> so. if, you believe in a, if you believe in a round earth rather than a that's, flat earth. Well, that's right. And, but that does remind me of that one congressman that was in this debate about one of the military bases mm -hmm. that was going to be moved on an island. And stone-faced, cold, serious, he yeah. said, if it goes too far on that side of the island, won't the island capsize? <laughs> <laughs> so how do we look it up on Google? You know, it's like a I congressman take... asked about capsized island. And you think to yourself, the closer I get to people in politics, mm -hmm. the more I realize that's the norm, not the exception. Anyway. Now, if that weren't a naval base, it would be even funnier. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, well, anyway, let me give you a little background for myself. You know, I worked uh, yeah. as a hedge fund trader. I'm from Chicago. And uh, I always tell people, like, I was lived in like a Grey Poupon neighborhood. I don't know if you remember those commercials where sure. you could just pass the Grey Poupon between homes. They were so close. Yeah. And if we saw a raccoon in our yard, we thought that was awesome. So I move out here to Connecticut. And we buy a place in Reading. Mm -hmm. We have a pastor in front. And every day we see 12 to 15 deer in the front yard, and we think, isn't that wonderful? And it is. Yeah, well, you got it. And we'd have them surrounded by yeah. turkeys, and we thought we are in this nature wonderland. Mm -hmm. Well, that doesn't work so well when your wife is a passionate gardener, because the deer kind of win. They do. And, well, she didn't want, my wife didn't want me hunting at all, and she was like, no, I'll leave the deer alone. You know, we're just going to spray the plants and vegetation. And so, you know, I'd get this Bob X. I don't yeah. know if you've ever heard of Bob X. Is what, it the, the greenish stuff that you, they put on the, the bottom half of Well, that's of what trees? the Reading Nursery sprays at like $1,100 per property per year. And it yeah. gets pretty expensive to try and keep, you know, the deer off the plants. But Bob yeah. X is a spray and it's um, fermented coyote urine. And it stinks so bad. So, okay, so you put this stuff in a little pump up spray and you spray all your plants. And you think, oh, that's great, I don't have to worry about the deer, but you're never gonna go in the yard because the yard stinks. So I'm out there year after year pumping this stuff up. And um, well, I mean, the reason I was doing it was because my wife was guarding and every time she's coming in with ticks. And you know, ticks carry on average two diseases mm -hmm. and there are 17 tick-related diseases you can get. Yep. Many of them are fatal. So the ticks are nothing, nothing to take lightly. So she was coming in with ticks all the time, and so we said, um, well, you know, we got this, there's a relationship here between the deer and the ticks, don't really get it, but we got to do something about the deer for sure, so we're going to work with deer repellent. So we started spraying Bobex, and one day, I got tired of spraying this stuff, I was, you know, I was the one that sprayed it, so I'm pumping this thing up. And this and stuff is how much, about $1,100 per year per yard? Well, that's, that's what the Reading Nursery sprays on it, and oh, that's, okay. that's like this rotten egg mix that they have. Well, it's oh. fully organic, though. Okay. And they've assured us that it's their, the, the eggs that they use are free range and uh, fully organic, fully <laughs> ac uh, antioxidants and all the rest, so it's a great marketing gimmick. But it's still a lot of money. And uh, so I, I, I would get this Bob X, it was yeah. coyote urine, just pump it up, pump it up. Yeah. And it was full of affluence, and it would just clog the sprayer all the time. And I get so frustrated with that thing. This one time I'm pulling it apart, and I forgot to re release the pressure in the pump. And I unscrew this thing, and it just goes poof. Oh. Now I've got my face, my, I'm just completely drenched in coyote urine. I thought to myself, there's got to be a better way. Now, isn't there, you know, I'm really kind of... Let's say turned off by the, the notion of, of coyote urine. But that's not the kind of urine I've been using in my yard for, for years. 
Well, is is it human or? I'm I'm not gonna say. Okay, does that work? Is it mine? I'm not gonna say. Okay, okay, all right. Well, let's hope your neighbors don't have cameras. So <laughs> anyway, um, you know, so I walked inside and I say, I said to my wife, that's it. I'm done spraying my yard. Well, my neighbor was mm. Georgina. She's a doctor, Georgina Scholl, and she'd been on the yep. Fairfield County Deer Management Alliance for years. And she's one of the smartest people on the subject I know. And she said, you know, your problem is, is just too many deer. If you get your deer numbers down, the tick problem resolves. Why yep. don't you come in and sit on some of these meetings with the, the Fairfield County Deer Management Alliance? Yeah. Did that for a year or so. And then she said, look, she's spent enough time on it. Would I be interested in being represented for Reading? Mm -hmm. I drew the short straw, said yes, and then I ended up being the chairman of the organization. Mm -hmm. And I d did lots, lots of research on it to make sure we're going down the right path and I wasn't being too terribly misguided. And sure enough, you know, the government has demonstrated yeah. with numerous reports, the DEP, Connecticut DEP, um, Howard Kilpatrick at the DEP, great guy, did his thesis on the correlation between deer densities and tick densities. And there's an absolute correlation. So just, you, just common sense tells me, and maybe common sense isn't so common, but that one would follow the other because it's the deer that have the ticks on them, correct? Well, you have and, one, you have the other, right? And yes, and deer do not get Lyme disease. So they're the perfect host. It's their immunity, yeah. Um, and if you look at the life cycle of a tick, yeah. you have the nymph stage and then you get to the adult stage where it reproduces. In order to get from limb stage to the reproductive stage, they have to feed on a large mammal. So they have to consume the blood of a large mammal. Well, you're, you can find lots of ticks on other animals. Now, possums actually preen themselves and pull the ticks off. Huh, Mice, okay. on the other hand, don't do such a good job, and you'll find, you will find light, er, um, ticks on mice and other rodents. Yeah. But they're not going to reproduce unless they get on a large mammal. Well, what are the large mammals in the woods? Well, you and I, we're pretty large, yeah, yeah. but we pick them off and you know, yeah. hopefully we're not helping them reproduce. But the, the deer is the largest mammal in the woods. Mm -hmm. and, and so... And, and the skin, it seems like the skin is, it is they're short-haired animals, so it's not, the deer don't have to, uh, the ticks don't have to crawl through, say, the hair of a, of a bear to get, to get to the blood source. So it just seems like the, the deer, if not the largest of mammals, certainly is probably the, the best suited for ticks. Correct yeah. or no? Well, I, I don't. I don't know if there's a real. I don't know if there's been a study done on the correlation on you know the thickness of the hair, the density of the hair, or whatever. All I know is that, um, and I posted a a YouTube video video if anybody wants to go to YouTube and look up uh, ticks on deer in Connecticut. Okay. And this video will pop up, and I actually had uh, harvested a deer, and yeah. it was so encrusted and infested. In ticks, yeah. that I thought, you know what? People really ought to see what's really going on in Connecticut. So if you go to Google and put in dick, uh, ticks on deer in Connecticut, yep, yeah, this video will pop up. Excellent. And it's kind, of <laughs> it's kind of funny because, you know, I didn't, I didn't really put a lot, too much thought into it. Maybe choose my words particularly well, but I made made the comment about, you know, you know, look at all the ticks on this poor little deer, and you know, one of the comments that was added below was. Well, that poor little deer was probably a little happier when it was alive than dead, but yeah. that's the way it goes. Well, that's 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 the, uh, the emotional side of the discussion, and yeah. we all have emotions, and I'm sure all of us, you know, we've all seen the movie Bambi, and from that perspective, yeah, we're all we're all pro deer. We all want to see deer prancing around the meadows, and as long as they don't, as you say, as long as they don't go into our, our wives' gardens or our gardens, then. Uh, but um, let's get on to the more serious side of deer control. Well. Um, so, after joining the Alliance, mm -hmm. getting a little bit more educated on the whole process, yeah. we started out, we said, well, so what can we really do to control deer densities? If you don't mind holding up that chart, yes, this sure. chart is a study that um, uh, Howard Kilpatrick had done at Mumford Cove in Connecticut here, and it shows that it was a very controlled study because it was in a cove, so they could absolutely you know limit um, the movement of deer in and off off the cove and you can see that um, the correlation is on the chart that shows that when deer densities were brought down mm -hmm. the number of ticks in Mumford Cove declined also mm -hmm. and then there was um, another study that was done 
that showed, and, and, and I'm not an advocate for getting rid of all the deer, but another study mm. was done in a similar type of environment yeah. at Mohegan Island where they removed all the deer mm. and lo and behold, no ticks. Mm -hmm. So people that say, hey, it's not about the deer, it's about the white-footed mouse, that's all noise. Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of silliness, but it always kind of gets a mouthpiece. Just to review, because I think it's important that people hear this, the, that, that difference between the white noise, the white, yeah, the white noise, the white mice and the deer, is that white mice are small and ticks need a larger animal to feed more blood off to reproduce. Right. Did I right. get that correct? Yes, that's right. And okay. the other thing is, is that you know, mice do not roam a wide area, but deer roam, roam a wide area. And I always tell people, just if once you start to visualize the deer walking through your yard as the equivalent of a B-52 bomber mm -hmm. dropping millions of tick eggs, then you start to think, well, I don't really know if I want those things in my yard. Yeah. So you go back a little ways and you start to think to yourself, well, how did we get ourselves into this mess in the first place? Mm -hmm. The reality is that there was no hunting season in Connecticut. Deer hunting season was, deer hunting was brought back to Connecticut around 1973. Okay. 1976, right there about 73, 76. People yeah. were getting sick from a mysterious disease mm -hmm. and then a doctor just defines it, hey, well, that's Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. It's a tick-related disease. So it just so happens that it correlates very well with, oh, we've got plenty of deer now, because the DEP did their job of protecting the deer. So the, the, the numbers and the facts started to line up and it led us to the scientific conclusion that, that deer and ticks was, Correlate. was, was correlating and what was the problem. So, um, <clears throat> so then the question is, so what do you do about this deer problem? Mm -hmm. The, the simple solution is that the, the, what caused this situation is the hunting season. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you didn't have a hunting season, if the government didn't have a defined hunting season, Correct. Yep. you wouldn't have so many deer. Mm -hmm. If you had no hunting season, in other words, if you had 12 months where you could hunt any time on your property, right. there would be no deer problem. Mm -hmm. So it's really the government that's, their involvement in this has caused this Lyme epidemic, epidemic with babesiosis and ehrlichiosis and all these other horrible diseases. Well intentioned and, and no harm, no, no right. criticism of the government on, in my mind's eye, but, but you're correct that that, that needed to change. Mm -hmm. that, that hunting season and that whole approach needed to change for a very good reason. Well, I had an opportunity about five years ago, I sat down at a game dinner and I sat right next to, um, uh, I, think, I think it's Daniel Esty, but he was the head of the DEP at the time. That's uh, Elizabeth Esty's husband. Right, yep. right. Yep. And I said, I said, you know, God, I'm such, I was really looking for this. I said, oh, I'm so glad I got your ear. We've got this epidemic in Fairfield County. We've got tens of thousands of people. Their lives are being ruined from Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. It's the most, tr and it's all because of the deer problems. And all we have to do is X, Y, and Z, and we can get these deer numbers down from 75 deer per square mile down to 10 deer per square mile. Yep. We're going to save so many lives. We're going to save human suffering. You know, all these people that are, have lost time at work, we're going to be more productive. This is going to be the greatest thing in the world. What do you think he said to me? Sounds like he probably wasn't ready to buy into that notion yet. What do you think he said to me? He nah, said, dude, we make a lot of money off of hunting. If there aren't many deer, we're not going to make any money. Now, it's ironic for, you know, a left-leaning guy to all of a sudden be like this capitalist. But here he is. There's a taking, little of it in all of us. Well, here he is taking advantage of, like, this capital gains at the expense of human suffering. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I threw up my hands and I said, you know what? Remember what Ronald Reagan said? Government isn't the solution. Government is the problem. That, and once again, you're not, you're not get any, no truer words could have been spoken. You're not going to get any agreement with me on that, but go ahead. So anyway, uh, so I, I went on this quest and I said, well, a lot of towns have tried, for example, Wilton and a few of these other towns, went on this quest of trying to work with government mm -hmm. to try and resolve the problem. So what we're going to do is we're going to hold hearings, we're going to have a deer commission, we're going to have a deer warden, and we're going to hunt on, on town properties. Well, the second you hunt on town properties, all the local people in the community can gang up against you yeah. and tweak, <clears throat> tweak the politicians and say, we want to protect the deer. <clears throat> and then they yeah. gin up the safety issue. Well, you know what? Yeah. Since they reinstated deer hunting, there hasn't been one human being adversely harmed by deer hunting. Now, guys have fallen out of stands. 
maybe they've cut themselves, hurt themselves, but they haven't shot anybody, thank God. I mean, that those situations in the history of hunting are so extremely rare. They're, I mean, I don't, they're not, any, any life that's harmed is not anything. Well, if there's, one thing, if there's one thing that the NRA does right, it does have very good safety classes for people that hunt. Yeah. To give people yeah. things they need to know to, in order to prevent mm -hmm. damage. Well, it's like you said before the show, I mean, you're a rational guy. You don't hunt and don't own a gun. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, with bow hunting, you're in a tree. You're shooting down at the ground. Your, your effective, you know, kill yeah. range is maybe 40 yards or so. Mm -hmm. That's pretty safe. And, you know what? Deer tend to not be walking where humans are walking. Right. So they kind of don't get along. And I've never seen a person that mistook a deer for a person. No. Or a deer for a dog. Amazing, right? That's that's a little better likelihood, deer for a dog. Well, everybody always says, person. I have a dog. And I always go, you got a miniature poodle, okay? Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, there are, a lot of, there, are a lot, there are a lot of dogs that, are, that, are, that approximate the size and, and body shape of a deer. Well, maybe but a they, Great Dane yeah. and, uh -huh. you know, like yeah. one month old deer or something. But whatever. Yeah. Um, that never happens either. So once, once people kind of get educated, mm. then they kind of get comfortable with it. So I, I watched what other towns were doing in terms of um, trying to get hunting on the town properties, all the hoops they jump through, mm -hmm. and how all politicians tend to be cowards. And all they need is one complaint, one letter to the editor. They're all afraid for their jobs. They don't mm -hmm. want to upset the status quo. That's true. Like, okay, I can't work with that at all. Um, so what, what we realized was that the majority, so we took surveys in, in Reading, Connecticut, and over 75% of the landowners in Reading, Connecticut wanted deer control. Mm -hmm. They wanted deer reduction. They were fed up with paying $1,100 to have their yard sprayed with rotten eggs. Yeah. They're sick of spending tens of thousands of dollars to put in landscaping only, only to see it mowed down by deer. Mm -hmm. I was getting phone calls left and right saying, hey, can you help us? Can you help us? So they weren't thinking about the deer take at that point? Well, it's a combination. I mean, the what? Reading Garden Club is probably our, our biggest allies in terms of deer control. Yep, I belong to and the Bethel Garden Club, so I know the Reading Garden Club pretty well. Yeah, they're beautiful people. And I can't tell you, I, I, I would go around and knock on doors and talk to people and they would give me their life story on how their life was ruined and, and they lost their job and they were paralyzed from Lyme disease or got Bell's palsy. Mm -hmm. I mean, ultimately it's a form of syphilis and untreated it can lead to death. I think essentially we all probably, each one of us probably knows somebody in our life that has been affected by Lyme disease. Yeah, I mean, it was estimated that 50% of the families in Connecticut, or 50% of the families in Fairfield County have been, have been adversely affected by mm -hmm. a tick-related disease. Mm -hmm. And like I said, the co-infection rate with ticks is, for every tick that has Lyme, most of them have a second infection as well. Um, so then I also had, was able to meet a guy by the name of Tony DiNicola, mm -hmm. who owns uh, uh, an outfit called Whitetail Solutions, and they're actually hired to go into communities yeah. and just harvest all the deer they can in a very controlled environment, in a very, very humane environment. It's instantaneous death for the deer. Uh, and they've had great, great success. They use bow or, or, um, or gun. They use rifle, mm -hmm. and they, you know, it's it's they shoot shoot the deer right in the ear. The the deer dies instantaneously. There's really absolutely no suffering with it, and they're they are the absolute best at what they do. And so there was some grant money that was available at the state level, and they came in and they did a research effort in kinetic in. Um, in Reading, and the biggest opponents, and they're, they're a total embarrassment to Reading, mm -hmm. were the local hunters. They were outraged at this because for 15 years, 20 years, the local hunters had Reading as their private hunting ground. Yeah, yeah. And they the had local a, they hunters, had a monopoly on it. Yeah, and anybody that was going to, they're, they're, they're a tough crowd. And yeah. you, you don't take them, I mean, I don't take them lightly. They don't really take them much at all, come to think of it. But anyway, um, so they, uh, they set it up. They're, Tony DiNicola comes in, harvests these deer. These guys were, the, the Reading Hunters were so dishonest that they were putting, you know, getting other deer blood and putting it in, on other people's property and accusing these guys of shooting these deer on this other property mm -hmm. and baiting, putting bait on other properties and just trying to implicate them and then calling the police on them and just really ruining the hunt. Even with all of that, the first year, they still took 50 deer in three weeks, mm -hmm. which is a remarkable, remarkable effort. Um, so what, what we started to do in Reading was we started an organization called Be Safe Reading. Yeah. And what we did was we started with local hunters and realized that they were pretty worthless because they wouldn't harvest every deer they could. Right. And we worked with um, the DEP to get hunters that 
I mean, it's a small community. A lot of people know each other, mm -hmm. and the DEP was really good about referring. Well, they're largely their friends that yeah. were in, from Massachusetts. Well, mm -hmm. guys in Massachusetts don't see many deer, and they couldn't come down here, and they would um, harvest every deer they could. Why is that? Why do people in Massachusetts not see many deer? I can't, I don't have a great answer for that, but I think that there's a lot more hunting up there mm -hmm. than there is in a residential neighborhood like Fair, Fairfield County. Okay. There's more open space in Western Connecticut, I'm sorry, in Western Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and a little more hunting, and the deer are more free ranging up there, and it's hard to get them in small areas. So they travel farther distances? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, because it, the deer that are out in, you know, open space, yeah have much much fewer encounters with human beings but the deer in Fairfield County have a lot of exposure to human beings so they're very comfortable around human beings consequently you know the scent control isn't as critical stuff like that and they're going to get in closer proximity mm -hmm. it's a little easier to hunt is there a better time of year or is there a worse time of year mm -hmm. to harvest deer to, to well I'm gonna use the word kill because it's fair enough it's killing <coughs> But it's harvesting also, we, you know, depending upon your perspective. Is there a better time of year? Is there a worse time of year to do it? Well, I think the, be I think the best time of year, well, two things. One, mm -hmm. um, they're more, the hunting that we do, what we do is landowners will contact us. Yeah. We'll you know, look at their property, see if it's a good property for hunting. If it is, what we'll do is we'll set up a 20-foot tree stand. We'll set up a corn feeder that comes and feeds, or that automatically feeds in the morning and at night. Okay. Set it up with a camera. You see what the pattern is on the deer, so you're not wasting a lot of time. Maybe you hunt once, maybe twice a week, but that's it. Okay. Now, the deer are more likely to be coming into bait in the winter because they're pressed for food. Yeah. So January, February, and March are the coldest seasons. Normally, we have a snow cover, except for this global warming. Ha! Get, we can get into that too, but we won't. Uh, so if we have a feeder, you're going to get the deer coming in in the winter. Um, the it is 40 degrees out today, and it's been 40 throughout the entire month of January. Yeah, but how do you get anybody to... the entire month of January, but let's not go there because that's... How do you get anybody to spend the money, spend their tax dollar, their money for a colder winter? Gee, I really want a colder, colder winter. I'll give you more money. It's Anyway, so I think the best time is January, February, March for, for deer hunting. Okay. And you certainly want to, you certainly want to um, harvest the doe while they're pregnant. Yep. It's on average the does have, you know, let's say uh, okay. two, two fawns every spring. Mm -hmm. If you get a, dawn while she's, uh, uh, a doe while she's pregnant, you know what, you got three deer. Yeah. So that's, that's optimal, I think. Yeah. Anyway, the effort in Redding has been phenomenal. I mean, we've gotten calls to go into commu small communities and harvest deer. So you get a lot of landowners and they say, good, get rid of as many deer as you can. Now, so some people say, well, what do you do with the deer? What we do is we butcher them and we give the food away. And when I tell you nothing goes to waste, we have people that are, are craftsmen that want the deer hides and they, we give them the deer hides and they tan them and use them for crafts and mm -hmm. making leather purses and gloves and all sorts. Of, and when I tell you they're ecstatic, they're out of their mind. Which is, which is quite similar. This notion of using the entire animal is, is what we've been taught by our Native Americans throughout, throughout the centuries. So always, when they took a buffalo, everything got used. Nothing yeah. went to waste. And that, that, to me, that really makes the taking of, of animal life much more palatable. Yeah. And then um, we've got dog owners lined up a mile long to get all the bones from the butchering process. Oh, okay. And then we have, I mean, I have a woman in town here that always wants the deer heart because her kids just love the deer hearts. And she co cooks them up, sautés them with mm -hmm. onions and stuff, feeds deer hearts. Uh, there is not a single thing on those deer that go to waste. So it, it's been kind of a win-win. We've gotten, I would say, uh, when we started this program, deer densities in the Except Redding for the area. deer, just kidding. Go ahead, continue. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 continue, continue. The other thing, you know, there was, there was a study that was just, done just, out. I'm just joshing you. No, I know. There was a study that was done out in um, the Tetons, mm -hmm. and they showed what happened when they reintroduced the wolf out there, mm -hmm. and the impact the wolf had on the deer herd, yeah. and it just changed the landscape. And the reason that so many bird species have disappeared in Connecticut mm -hmm. is because the understory has been completely you know, deforested okay. by the deer and they have no place to hide. In Redding now, we're seeing trillium and all these plants come back that we haven't seen in Connecticut for 15 or 20 years because of the deer. So because of this deer effort, we've got our deer down. It's, I don't know what the exact deer number is because they don't like register for a census and they're not required to have an ID. But 
These deer density levels are probably down inside 30 deer per square mile, maybe 20 deer per square mile. We don't mm -hmm. really know. Yeah. But like that chart said, if we get down inside 10 deer per square mile, the tick problem goes away. So from an environmental perspective, bringing back that balance of nature between plants and animal life and keeping everything within reason is generally good overall. Well, I, I'm I, I can't find any reason to argue against it. So on our property now, we have no ticks. Mm -hmm. I mean, I went, I went hiking on land trust land. Now, the land trust won't let yeah. you hunt, right? right? Because they protect all species of animals, just not humans. Correct. And well, at least, they're, really, oh, they're yeah. really keen to protect the ticks, I guess. I don't know. But my beef with the land trust is, if you hike the land trust, you're coming back absolutely covered in ticks. I hiked the land trust parcel about two years ago, and I was in the truck. My, my uh, actually, was a Subaru coming back. Mm -hmm. I looked down on my pants. And they were crawling, and ticks give me the creeps. I come home and I take a piece of um, duct tape and start pulling them off. There were so many, 35 of them. Wow. 35 ticks from a one hour hike in the land trust. Mm -hmm. So the land trust has to be harvested. I, I think they're really um, irresponsible citizens, if you will, in Reading, in that they do not allow deer management on their property. You know, we, we lose all this revenue to the land trust because we can't tax it. Right? Correct. Yep. It's like churches. Yeah. So. And, and in the meantime, well, the, ta the churches do give something back, right? I mean, they feed the poor and a lot of other things. But with the land trust, all they do is they protect the land and say, aren't we great? But the problem is you can't hike the land. So we lose the tax revenue and we can't hike the land because you come back covered in ticks. I mean, mm -hmm. I always tell everybody, whatever you do, don't hike the land trust. Well, it's, a good, it's a good opportunity to, to teach our kids to, hey, you know, read the signs. I'm sure they have signs going into these hiking trails that say, oh, by the way, ticks, do they? Well, they started putting them up, and mm -hmm. then the people that were impacted by it said, we don't want to deter people from hiking in the woods in Connecticut. So they started taking the signs down. So hike at your own risk. If you're hiking here, you should know that there's a tick problem. Okay. We're coming down to the end of our show. Uh, Dave Strait, Dave Stevenson, uh, two folks that, as you've heard in the midst of this discussion, probably have a few things that we might joust about. And, and if the show goes on much longer, we might have to... We might both might have to draw out the knives and start slicing each other. I'm a peaceful person. <laughs> As am I. But this has been Progressive Soup. My name is David Stevenson. Dave Strait, my guest. Thank you for joining me, sir. Thanks, Dave. Look and, this uh, up at Fairfield County Deer Management Alliance, fcdma.com. Now we've got to find out something else we agree upon. Maybe we can. There Thanks for joining us.